what are the three things you value most in life? Wow. The, the two most recurrent traits throughout various human value traditions are sometimes extrapolated out to be wisdom and compassion, right? Or wis wisdom and, and compassion can kind of be understood to be like kindness and love all kind of like rolled into one, right? So I guess you could say the number one thing I value is the ability and act of attaching oneself to other beings in the universe and valuing them therein to the same degree or a greater degree even than you value your own ego and sort of that survival mentality. And then the second thing, which would be like wisdom, would be um, the ability to and the act of coming into a greater understanding of the objective realities of others and their existences, and in fact, the existence of the universe as it exists outside of oneself. So that would be one and two, which is interesting because it's kind of a set that contains the question itself, like the ability to assign meaning to things is the ability to attribute value to them. So the question is very fascinating because the question you've asked is itself a significant part of one of the sets of the things that is the answer. Like the ability to say like, what do I, I am so grateful and in fact value my ability to evaluate things up to and including this question which is one of the most significant things that a human being can do is deciding what it is they most value. So I think that's included in, in, in that sort of wisdom answer, right? And then I think number three would be a good late night diner meal. Every single person that I've asked this question to has said food. <laughs> Every single person. I shit you not. I was like, in the back of my head, I was like, is he going to say food? Because this is going to blow my mind. Everybody's, why food? I think food is, well, I'll speak for myself and say that if you work as a comedian and you answer questions too seriously, because I think the, the first two answers I gave are my best attempt at an honest answer. The temptation on the third one to de-heighten the stakes and say something silly becomes too great to resist. But I think that they're probably the reason that everyone has said food on your thing is that it would feel disrespectful to give a bunch of answers that were at the top of Maslow's hierarchy of need. You know what I mean? It would give, it would feel like all I need is a sense of self-actualization. I vibrate. I am a being made of pure light and song, and I float through life. It feels like a respectful tip of the hat to our animal nature to be like, no, food is very up there. It's important to me <laughs> that I be well fed. So yeah, love, wisdom, and food are the three things that I, I most value. So there's this old Buddhist story, which is like you are born... Uh, the outline of a sketch and through your life you fill in the details you complicate each section you add shading where there's shading your environment casts a shadow on the piece of paper that you are and so each one of those things whether it be the amount of love in your life the amount of uh, the ability to accrue wisdom which i think is almost inbuilt into your answer and then finally the amount of how much nutrients you have to sketch that that picture of yourself as much as as it is uh kind of the, the comedic tip of the hat it it does feed into something half feed there's a little joke there didn't mean to do that um <laughs> it does feed into this deeper sense of like i want to continue this if i don't have food i have i have nothing i want to continue to love and to empathize and and to learn and to be more there is that that um michelle obama book which is called becoming but mm -hmm. the far more interesting title is the the buddhist concept of becoming which is the being the hierarchical self you talk about maslow's hierarchy but without without anything else you are constantly complicating from as a child you complicate up to a person and then you complicate to an idea after you die like 
these are very impactful things that you value, I think. There is a great, I think you're, you're talking about something that like we see in a lot of different disciplines, this idea of like the compound fractal self, right? Of like, I am, you know, like biologists talk about like your brain state, like they, you know, they probably wouldn't use these terms speaking at their like full jargon with each other. But when they're speaking to lay people, they'll be like, oh, your lizard brain, and then your like mammal brain, and then your primate brain, you know, they sort of like, and it's a way of saying like, oh, you're existing at all these different consciousnesses at the same time. You are a compound being. There's first of all, A, a lot of comedy that comes from that because it's inherent, it inherently subverts expectations when you're trying to be enlightened and then you're like, my back hurts. Um, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> you know, existing on these multiple levels is funny. It's just funny in and of itself. But yeah, I think very much so. And I think it's true too, that like th there is something beautiful about those, that level of like existing on nutrients. Cause there it's very, cause you know, you're talking about love, wisdom, and food. The one, that third one is the one most concerned with the self, which, you know, there's so much built into trying to be selfless as an aspiration, but also, the self is your little guide. It's your it's your mediator. Like that is the medium through which you get to experience the, all this this universe, uh, except for a very rare few who find a way to you know astral project or otherwise divest themselves of all ego and experience the universe that way. And hey, you know, good on them. That's 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 very it's very it, impressive. Uh, it sounds sick as hell. <laughs> like I mean, I. I I, I, I'm not saying that I would like to, uh, at some stage, be taken out of my own body and soul and like shoved into some vast realm of incomprehensible nothingness, but I'm not saying I wouldn't either. <laughs> if there's like a test period or a yeah. trial of that. <laughs> like 14 day free it. trial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll do it. Yeah, it's like, so I'm on blockers and estrogen, so I got a thing to block my testosterone and I got estrogen to and it complicate and that is honestly I, I was talking to avery monson um about this and he found this fascinating my perception of color mm -hmm. has changed since i've been on estrogen i see colors differently do you know the way there's like that that the qualia debate in in philosophy you know do we see red the same way what do you taste the same cup of coffee that i do which i always found to be so reductive because like how are you ever going to know unless you experience all of those things but green that i see now is different to the green i saw and uh not only that but i i existed with this kind of veil of like blackness around my vision for so long and now it's gone and i see everything like this is the reddest shit i've ever seen this is, <laughs> this is the fluffiest shit i've ever seen you know what i mean it it's like this metaphysical viscerality i feel like i've been punched in the face by the universe it's awesome that's incredible congratulations <laughs> on your new suite of superpowers yes, um, yes. It's well. It's amazing too because that's I, I had actually I have never spoken to someone who could like empirically vouch for the truth of estrogen being linked to perceiving a broader spectrum of colors. But I had read something scientifically about this exact. It was an article about various like scientific things that basically uh, that manifested in culture as pieces of extremely rote misogyny that were actually explicable through really basic science. And one of them was that thing of like, you know, like a, a commercial for clothes and there's some cloddish dude who's like, uh, that's blue and that's blue. And then there's some woman who's depicted as being frivolous being like, no, that's like cerulean and that's Azure or something like that. And the, and the article basically being like, no, there's a lot of data that like, you, that there is a broader spectrum of color that the presence of testosterone or something like that just like prevents you from being able to see so all these times that you were like oh this is like a frivolous knowledge of colors that we're we're making it a cultural thing and we're denigrating it is actually like you're saying a superpower it is a very real ability to perceive much finer granulation extremely cool tell me a memory which shaped you 
when I was very, very young, like four years old, my mother, whose name is Elaine Lee, she's an incredible comic book, uh, comic book writer, actress. She was had her own theater company back in New York, back in the day. She was like nominated for a daytime Emmy. She was in a soap opera. Very cool, accomplished woman who studied Irish polytheistic paganism for a long time. Tuatha Dé Danann, the Fomorians, the, the whole uh, legends of ancient Ireland. And I was raised on a lot of those legends and she was very, I'm just like, very connected into that like Joseph Campbell kind of mode of being, right? Like a lot of knowledge of like not only specific myths, but also mythology more broadly, right? And when I was very little in New York, I was living in an apartment with her and I was like around four years old and I was sleeping on a futon. And so I didn't have monsters under my bed because my bed was just a solid mattress flush to the floor. But I was worried about monsters being outside of my window you know eight stories up in this apartment building and i would basically go like hey i'm like mom i'm scared there's like monsters at the window and she ended up <laughs> doing this thing where unlike a lot of parents who might have been like don't worry sweetie monsters aren't real you're not in danger monsters aren't going to get you there's no such thing as monsters she was like oh the monsters want to eat you well okay well we know they're hungry otherwise they wouldn't be trying to break through the window and eat you. So every night before bed, we're gonna do a little ritual and we're gonna get a cookie and we're gonna open up the window and put the cookie on the outside windowsill and invite the monsters to come eat that cookie. And then we're gonna close the window and you go to bed and the monsters will have the cookie. And we did that for a week. And at the end of the week, little four-year-old Brennan was like, mom, I'm friends with the monsters now. They actually appreciate the cookies, uh, which was the best example of like pagan, like propitiation of the spirits, but also like yes, anding a child's internal mythology and being like, I can't fight this. We have to just redirect this energy. That's beautiful. Yeah, an early lesson in yes and from my mom and uh, also a lesson in how best to approach the spirits of darkness out in the world. So All there right. you go. What's your favorite color? There's so many answers that jump to mind. But if I was going to be honest and say, what's the color that I would find most pleasing if it just appeared as a color, like a swatch of it just appeared? Probably a lovely, like, sky blue, a nice light blue. Why? I like the sky. Just the, a, 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 the perfect weather is like a, a sunny day with one or two well-placed clouds to block direct sunlight from hitting my... Irish skin, <laughs> uh, uh, horribly burning me. That was one thing about being in Ireland was the climate. I couldn't, everyone warned me about the weather and the weather was the most agreeable. Every day, a nice light misting of rain was perfect. It was, it was ideal as opposed to the glaring Los Angeles sun. But yeah, I would say a lovely sky blue because uh, there's nothing better than being out on like a, a nice crisp windy day with a clear blue sky is like that's primo it's perfect tell me in as much detail as you can about something you knew of which once existed and now does not the upright citizens brigade chelsea theater which was the location that i performed at when i was a younger comedian performing in new york which is loaded with a lot of memories and it's a very interesting time because obviously we're going through this moment of extremely necessary cultural upheaval in the United States and around the world as well, but especially in the US, where we are confronting these old, very powerful monoliths of racism and uh, sexism and capitalism and these things that have completely shaped and defined the, sh uh, the shape of our culture and society and how individuals are either destroyed or exalted by that culture. And UCB, uh, which is the theater that I trained at and came up in, is definitely reckoning with those now, having made a lot of, over the years, huge mistakes in terms of, you know, the opportunities that were present there for POC performers, the, uh, the fact that performers were never paid for their labor, XYZ thing. Now, thankfully, the owners seem to be listening to the community about how to improve. So it's this very mixed thing where I look back at a place that completely shaped who I am 
you know, I think that everyone has has this moment where they're wrestling with, uh, you know, as it seems like we are as a globe dragged kicking and screaming into the future, where you look back at these institutions that had incredibly toxic or problematic elements to them, and then still have to reckon with all of the deep and abiding friendships you made, all of the important life lessons that you learned. And um, I think back to all the things that that theater could have done better. And then I also think about my first time, like Harold Knight walking out on that stage. The Chelsea stage was this beautiful, it was like surrounded on three sides by seats and the stage was completely floor level and the seats came up right onto the stage. So there was no, you couldn't get more intimate. When the place was packed, there would literally be a, a row of people sitting crisscross applesauce on the stage that would just, you know, eat up about, you know, 25% of your stage space. And if you were performing there, they were just on the, they were just on this. It would be like if you went to a Broadway show and the whole stage was like ringed with just people sitting on their butts on the ground. It was the most like incredible and, and, you know, improv absolutely curdles when any, dignity is given to it when any kind of pomp is given to it and so having people sitting on their butts on the ground that could just reach out and touch your leg if they wanted to took away all the pretension that space enabled you to do these kind of subtle moves that would be impossible in a larger space because everyone's right up in your grill they're they're on top of you so a, a tiny little whimpered line, just one raise of an eyebrow, and you could crush. It would be an explosion of laughter, which in a different space would have been impossible. So with all of the acknowledgments of the failures of an institution that I devoted many years to, there is a part of me that hopes that it learns the lessons of its past or that it is just straight up replaced by something better without as much of a tangled and problematic history. But um, there is still some nostalgic part of me that thinks about that Chelsea stage that is no more. The, the space was given up for the theater to move elsewhere and um, thinks about all the memories and insane moves and great shows and walking up the steps and walking to McManus, which is a pub around the corner and you know, either living in humiliation from a bad show or celebration of a good show and those physical landmarks that are just etched into the surface of my heart. I really miss that, that physical space. That is a thing that was, that is no more. What, if anything, is perfect? I'm going to go ahead and say, I'm going to take you up on the if any clause. I don't think anything is perfect. I don't think anything is perfect. I think that perfect is much like we have the cardinal direction west, but you can never get to like the west pole. You know, there's no final place of westness that you can get to. I think that's perfect, right? Like it is a cardinal direction, but it is totally relational. And I don't think anything in our universe has that, which is weird that, and, and a cool trick that, that we are able to pull off as a species to have an idea that is, you know, like t mentally speaking, at least you can kind of wrap your head around, you're like perfect, perfect, something with, without flaw. It's a weird thing where we have this ability to take things that are fictional, but um, ascribe traits to them that then can or cannot be met. You know, like you can like, there's never been a unicorn, but we can all, but we all know that if you showed us a mythical horse with two horns, we'd be like, that's not a unicorn. It's got too many horns. It's got one more than you need to be a unicorn. And it's like, but that's a fictional construct, but we know that we know things about it. And I think that's probably perfection, right? Which doesn't mean that it's not an important concept or not something that is like, you know, the way there's like a bunch of great old poetic sayings, like you can never reach the stars, but you can chart your ship by them, right? Like that concept of perfection as a direction without being a destination feels beautiful slash useful to me. Who is your favorite character from fiction of any kind? Whoa. Um, that's such a great question. Weirdly, 
I think that anyone who has played as much Dungeons and Dragons as I have has a weird answer to this question because there is something about characters created in a story that so intimately belongs to you and your close circle of friends that kind of makes those characters impossible to compete with. I'm thinking about my long running home game that I've been playing for 11 years now and the player characters therein. And I think all six of them are kind of tied for first place in my head because I've spent 11 years of my life with my closest friends telling me a story about those characters that only we have. And that feels so exceptional to me, but to, to, to not cheat so much and pick a single character. I find myself, I find myself a lot in the last year or two quoting Gandalf a great deal and sort of being this like primordial wizard character that really kind of, I don't know, gives like shape to the this like fantasy conception of what a wizard is, of this like very wise and good, the good wizard in a lot of ways. And I think a lot about how prescient the quote is that Gandalf says to Frodo in the minds of Moria, where Frodo goes like, I wish this, I wish the ring had never come to me. I wish this had not happened in my time. Basically it's just like, you know, having grief over living in an extremely terror and fear filled moment and ha- and sort of feeling the weight or responsibility of history on him. And, you know, Gandalf just goes, uh, so do all who live to see such times, but that is not for them to decide. All that we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to us. And something about that one line is a v- just a verbal anxiety reducer for me in a way that I can't really describe. I just think about that quote and I get leveled out and fear and anxiety goes away, which is like a fictional character casting a spell through the fourth wall. I feel that I am have a reprieve from fear when I think about that one piece of advice. So I'll go Gandalf. A kind of a similar quote for me, and I can't remember where I saw this from. There's a dude on the street and he's like sitting down, he's kind of half drunk and he's bemoaning his life and, and like he lost his job because his business uh, blew up and everything like that. And he's like, oh my God, my life sucks. And every, like, you know, there's war. I, it's set like pre-World War II. The war is just starting. And he's like, oh, well, war is starting now. And a guy, a random guy kind of walks past him on the street and is like, would you rather someone else live it? And your man said, huh, no. I would not inflict this on somebody else. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. What fascinates you? I've just been watching a series of lectures on the biology of behavior and about all of the different life systems that impact behavior in animals and humans. And so that's what's on the the brain right now. And it's a very interesting series of lectures because a, a lot of the justification or point of it is that it's a, it's addressing like our criminal justice system and our cultural ideas of morality and coming from this scientific perspective of like, hey, it seems very likely that biologically speaking, free will is not a thing. Like, you know, everything eventually becomes explicable through elements of our biology, our neurology, our inner chemistry, which is affected by our lives growing up and generational trauma and X, Y, Z other things. And even those things that you had within your control, nature versus nurture, you still didn't really, you didn't as a child have them in your control. And then as you enter into adulthood, so all of these systems that we understand more and more as being like, oh, we we are all vastly interconnected and our responsibility is really like permeates throughout, you know, no, no one is an island. We exist in unity with each other. But our criminal justice system and our kind of cultural ideas of morality are like some people are monstrous and other people have through strength of will figured out how to always do the right thing. And that that is uh, really not what's happening. And, and and there is like, it's interesting because like, will our morality catch up with it, like our understanding of, you know, all of the nuances and complexities of behavior? That's one thing that's caught my, caught my interest right now. 
um, just as a philosophy major whose entire sphere of understanding is slowly but surely chipped away by science each and every day. I've wrestled a lot with, with, you know, the kind of like push and pull in public conceptions of morality between utilitarianism on the one side and deontology on the other. And it seems that there's this incredible, at least in like modern American culture, there's this incredible series of forces at work to really demonize utilitarianism. Like, you know, Adrian Veidt in Watchmen is like the ultimate utilitarian villain. Like, look, I decided that the ends justify the means and I made this squid bomb to prove it. And <laughs> you go, spoilers for a you know 30 year old comic book. But what's very interesting about the whole Adrian Veidt situation is you see that all the time, this, this like demonization, even like Captain America in one of the, and I keep bringing up pop culture because pop culture is what determines our cultural values way more than a dusty book of philosophy. Like pop culture is what the culture is saying is relevant. You know, there's a thing where like Captain America in the last Avengers movie, when Vision is like, I, like you must destroy me to save everyone. And Captain America goes like, we don't trade lives. And then, it, and then you're like, what? And then it cuts to a war in Wakanda where they're extremely trading hundreds of Wakandan lives. You go like cap, this is not a good look, my guy. You're like, all, so all these Wakandans are going to die to save one British robot. Can't you just like get his, backup hard drive like why are we this seems not in any case all of that is to say that like utilitarianism gets it seems to be particularly demonized but the issue i always have is that if you look at the deontological side of people know how to demonize the ends justify the means they go you'll be willing to do anything for what you think is the cause but the flip side of that which is the deontological is of course that the means justify the ends right that like, as long as I've done what my rule system, what my deontological system has said, any end that that produces is correct because I've followed the rules, right? So that's monstrous number one, because it means that people can engage in behavior. Uh, you know, there's a big thing that is correct in current social justice movements about its impact over intent, which is kind of a refutation of deontology. Like the effect you had is more significant than whatever you were hoping was going to happen, right? And then the secondary thing there too is I don't know how you get deontology kind of like without magic, right? I, I like because. The whole purpose of deontology is it's a categorical imperative or it's a rule system, it's 10 commandments, right? You're following this set of edicts, but I don't know how you get those edicts without a semi-supernatural authority, without some kind of cosmic stamp of approval, like these are the rules that we know work, right? And even when Kant tries to to, to get it as like self-justify, a little like M.C. Escher self-reinforcing staircase of like, no, the categorical imperative, you know, like do nothing to someone else that you would not wish to have them, you know, like that sort of golden rule mentality. It's, there is still underneath that a little hovering mechanic of authority or of like, this justifies itself or trust us that this rule is golden. Like this is the rule that will always produce the best result. And I think that you need a degree of faith to subscribe to those modes of thinking that I am uh, straight up not comfortable with. My always response to that was like, well, what happens if I just want to get stabbed? So is it okay then if I just go around stabbing people? If I want to get stabbed, just deontologically speaking, it's okay because I'm totally fine. If everyone in my society, if I built a society of people who wanted to get stabbed, then it's okay for me to just stab people because they're all getting stabbed and then I will eventually get stabbed. The only thing it would suck for is the last person because they wouldn't get stabbed unless you did like a Hunger Games thing where you both stabbed each other at once, but who knows. Uh, what other job would you like to do if you weren't doing this? My life was very changed by a man named Tom Davis, who was my philosophy professor when I was going to school uh, for philosophy when I was a, a youngster and he had such a profound impact and I've always thought wouldn't it be nice if I was like a little a little old man to be off in the woods somewhere like writing 
fantasy novels and having a day job where I was like teaching at a, a community college because Tom Davis worked at uh, it became part of the SUNY system. So it was a, uh, it was a state state school. Uh, uh, SUNY Ulster was where I went when I was I started going there as a little homeschool kid when I was 14. If you can picture anything more obnoxious than a 14 year old philosophy major, please be my guest. But it was really life changing. And he was such a good professor. Yeah, being being a little old academic at a state school somewhere would be very I would like that. That would that would be what I would want to do if I wasn't doing this. What is your most prized physical possession? This is a podcast, so I'm going to do something v- visual and describe it. This is my most prized vis- physical possession. I'll hold it up. That's so um, fucking cool. I don't know what it is, but it just looks cool. It doesn't look cool. Uh, this is called the Adventure Coin. It is a good luck charm I've had since I was 15 years old. Um, it has been in my front left pocket almost every single day since I was 15. It goes with me everywhere. I lost it for a year one time, fully lost it, and found it under a floorboard, like a baseboard heater in a cafe in a neighborhood I didn't live in. And I guess I had lost it there the year prior. And I was there a year later and was like, Oh, this was, I was like, oh yeah, this is one of those cafes where I, I, I was on like, like during like the day or so that it, it could have gone missing somewhere. And I looked under the baseboard and covered in dust. There it was. It is such a beloved, important little treasure, a great good luck charm. The way I got it is truly crazy. I know that I'm like telling a lot of stories on this podcast and I, I, accept and acknowledge that the credibility of these stories as they compound is slowly ebbing away. So I will tell a story and leave it to your kind listeners, whether they choose to believe it or not. I can only, all I can do as an individual is swear that this really happened. I was doing a land walk at the Woodstock day school for a week of summer camp at a camp that I work at called the Wayfinder Experience when I was 15. And the Wayfinder Experience is a live action role playing summer camp. So they do LARP. And I was working story there. So I needed to like look at what sites were usable on the land for us. And I was just doing it by myself. Like I was, we were there doing setup, doing like load in. So there were no kids there yet. And the Woodstock Day School has like an outdoor educational campus that has a lot of like fields for playing and capture the flag and running around. And it also has a lot of like, nature trails and stuff so as i was walking and remember this is the day before campers arrive we're just doing setup i'm walking i'm 15 and a a girl like around my age or a little younger breaks out of the wood line barefoot in a white lacy dress she's got like glittery makeup on and she has a fairy wings on her back like white and lavender sparkly fairy wings on her back. Now, I want to be clear, I did not full stop hallucinate a fairy. She was, you know, she was like five, five some odd, whatever, tall. Um, And the wings were clearly on elastic bands and they were bouncing and stationary. Um, Or she was one of the fair folk and my mortal mind had to not see the fullness of her true fae form. Uh, one of those two things. She ran up to me. And at first, because like people dress like that at our LARPs all the time. She literally looked like someone who was in costume for games. So it didn't, it, it wasn't out of the question because we were there setting up a LARP camp, but it was like a Sunday loaded. So there shouldn't have been participants. There shouldn't have been campers there. She sprinted out of the wood line came up to me and approached me and I was like, hi, are you here? Like, are you here three days ahead of time or whatever for the, you're, you're here a day early just for the day where we like introduce ourselves and like play, you know, like field games. You're three days early to be in costume. But I just was like, hi, are you here for the, and she ran up, uh, took my hand, put this coin in it, laughed and ran back into the forest. That's insane. Did you ever see her again? I have never seen her again. I have, um, she appeared, ran to the woods. She didn't show up the next day as a camper. 
she was not a participant that week in that event. Now, again, I need to talk about like the plausible deniability of all this. This campus is in Woodstock, New York. The demographics of a like middle to high school aged teenager in Woodstock, New York, having access to fairy wings and glitter makeup is over 50%, right? So, so plausible, all plausible that someone totally unrelated to our LARP camp was dressed that way and decided to send me into an existential spiral for the, the next 17 years of my life. Very easily could be what happened. But uh, ran up to me, put the coin in my hand, laughed and ran back into the woods. That's insane. That is, what does it say? So there's Chinese characters on the, the coin, right? What do they? Yes. So it's there. There are, uh, I believe, Chinese characters on the coin. It's metal, but it's a, it's very, very thin. Um, it's also, as you can see here, it's a button, right? So it's a button from a coat. I, I call it a coin, but it has these two little holes in the top that mean that it should be able to be sewed onto something. So I don't know what the characters mean. I don't know what garment it came from. And it is a very, yeah, it's, it's like, it sort of feels like brass or copper. It conducts heat very well. Like if I, if I hold onto it with my thumb and forefinger, it'll get warm almost right away. And it is the first of many little magical trinkets and charms that I got my hands on. Like once I got that, I started like paying attention to little magical things and like collecting them as I go along and I have them in my my desk at work now. I used to carry around a lot of them when I was a teenager. And now I just carry the the adventure coin as a as a stand in and, and spokes object for the others that are safely in my desk at home. Why is it called the adventure coin? Did you come up with the name or yeah, I started calling it that because the summer that I got it, I was like, well, this is the wildest thing that's ever happened. This is clearly, clearly I need to never let this thing out of my sight. And then the rest of that week, it was, you know, it's it's one of those things where like, it's a very crazy thing that happened, but also in the, in the span of things, I would, t I would tell people what had happened. And the story is sort of hard to believe, but also very anticlimactic. It's like a fairy ran out of the woods and gave me this coin. And they're like, wow, what happened next? And you're like, I had a coin. I still <laughs> have it. It's not been clear what the next step is. So yeah, a pretty straightforward for me what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to adventure. And the and the rest of that summer, I would start. Be, you know, we were like we would be hanging out in New Paltz, and I would be like, let's go, let's let's all just like walk to the diner. I feel like maybe it, it was almost like the presence of the coin and the lack of clarity around what I was supposed to do with it started to prompt outings with friends to discover its hidden purpose, which became a self reinforcing loop because we would go on these very fun adventures together. To, uh, to the diner, to a park at night, to some all the, the places that teens and youths go to uh, act up and, and goof around. And, and then it became obvious that the coin, in asking us to search for a purpose for it, had achieved its purpose. Oh, the real treasure was the friends you made along the way. No! Cliché! Oh, God! Oh, God! <laughs> That's wild. If you could name a hot sauce, what would you call it and why? I would I would do very old timey kind of like parchment wrapped bottle of a sauce that we I would have it be a kind of lighter shade of red, not deep or vibrant, and we'd call it Uncle Brennan's old timey mild sauce for weak mouths. Um, <laughs> for, for why why weak mouths? <laughs> I have a weak mouth. I, my mouth can't take the spicy stuff. It, it, when I when I eat it, I go, "Why would you hurt yourself like this? You've made this food painful. You've made the food painful." <laughs> this was the thing I was most looking forward to today was to eat whatever this is, and and now <laughs> the thing that I most trusted, I was going to let this inside of my body. And the first thing it did when it just got into the into the waiting room, into the antechamber, <laughs> was hurt me. Uh, I'm betrayed. I've been betrayed by this food. <laughs> That's incredible. 
That's so good. What inspires you? I think the answer to this question is there. It it's pretty vast. I think that like I envy people that have a like wellspring that they can continually go back to. I think that the sources of inspiration are like basically any anything that is routine breaking by definition almost has the ability to be inspiring listening to new music going on a trip to somewhere you haven't been before going to a museum you haven't seen before like i just think almost any i i i I, uh talk with this about this with my partner a lot because uh every once in a while i will realize that i've been falling into my own head for a number of seconds or minutes and snap back into reality with uh my wonderful partner izzy kind of like bending over and like waving into my face and being like hello (laughs) hello where did you go (laughs) um which is you know um uh, adorable uh, uh, thank you. Uh, I, I like to view it as adorable and not um, deeply concerning that I <laughs> seemingly at random eject from reality uh, with with neither warning or anything else. But I think that's probably a lot of uh, people that that write or do other creative things. Like there's so much outside of writing, which is like sitting at the word process or typing the letters out. And for me, I'll be honest, like, like one of the things that I miss the most living under quarantine and also living in Los Angeles, I remember treasuring riding the subway in New York because without cell service, I was suddenly forced to just exist in mental space for like 15 to 45 minutes at a time and be like, huh, I guess I'll think. And sometimes that's inspiring as well, just forcing yourself into moments where you're letting your own head kind of, I don't know, lucid dream during your waking life. You're like, yeah, I guess guess daydream. I'm like looking for a complex explanation for just daydreaming. But I think it's very important to have those little moments where you allow your brain to just go where it wants to, uh, which can be as much of a source of inspiration as like exposing yourself to new experiences and media as well. So the short answer is everything. I think everything has the potential to be uh, inspirational. There's a beautiful art to staring at the ceiling. This is my... This is my recent discovery because of this book, which is the reason why I wanted to, to bring it up. Is this book? Uh, it's two books actually. It's Haruki Murakami. It's called uh, "Hear the Wind Sing." And if you are going to read something during quarantine, you should definitely read this book. It's exceptional. It's so good. <laughs> because I was reading this, and then like I don't sleep very well, and there's a, a certain art to staring at the ceiling, because. When was the last time you actively stared at your own ceiling? Like not passively thinking about something, not like trying to sleep, but just actively stared at your own ceiling. I'm doing it right now because I haven't thought about it. What do you see when you stare at the ceiling? That's my question. Because I see dreams and hopes and tomorrow and the bumps and creases of my ceiling. And like my house is kind of old, so it's all these patchwork of, of different you know over the years people fixing ceilings and stuff and you look there and you see because your brain pretty quickly will go well there's nothing here and you have to focus it up and and go what is here like what is active and this book doesn't ever ask the question should you stare at the ceiling and it, i don't think the character or the main character of it ever stares at the ceiling or anything like that but it, it's quiet and it's contemplative and i realized i can't remember the last time i stared at the ceiling i, I think there there is an artwork to it and I think the cheater, the, the one person that ever perfected this art was Michelangelo, right? Painting the Sistine Chapel. But he cheated because it wasn't his ceiling. He was getting paid to do it. And he drew over the blankness, which kind of defies <laughs> the whole point, you know? Uh, <laughs> the next time that you can't sleep or you, you find yourself getting lost in these moments, actively just indulge in the art of staring at your ceiling. I guarantee you... The next time you're bored, I guarantee you, you're going to look up and you're going to go, I should stare at the ceiling. You should do that because it's awesome. That is great. I I am, com- no force on earth could have restrained me from starting to look at my ceiling as soon as you started to talk about how cool it is to look at your ceiling. I was like, what am I missing? I looked at it. <laughs> That's great. I love that. Did you ever have an epiphany? And if so, what was it about? Um, God, I hope I've had several and continue to have them 
they're great when they happen and oh so rare um yeah that's a really good one trying to think of huh, there i'm thinking of one right now actually this is interesting i keep doing this but i want to actually look up the 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 like word perfect definition of an epiphany a moment of sudden revelation or insight i think an epiphany that was very meaningful to me and i unfortunately i i because it involves people that aren't me i cannot tell the details of what caused the epiphany but effectively i'll give a, a loose shape of it effectively a person in my life had been wronged in a very deep and profound way. And I was much younger and was very uh, angry. And I, I f despite trying to like move through the world with a lot of grace, I, I like most uh, feeling people of conscience, carry a huge amount of rage <laughs> around with me uh, at all times, at the state of the world, at uh, the fact that things could be good and instead are often bad due to the uh, things that are within our control, right? At least in theory. And I was talking to this person, effectively, I was g being a voice for justice of the retributive kind of like, there are these individuals that have done these wrong things and they need to be held to account. And the person who had been effectively was like talking about like moving on and forgiving these people and yada, yada, yada. And I was like, you can't forgive them. That, that lets them off the, off the hook and they need to be punished. And I was doing this, talking to the person who was, and then effectively what the person said to me that caused the epiphany was they were like, they were like, I've all, I'm the person who suffered here, and I'm making the decision for my life to be as good as it can be, and these are the steps that I want to do to do that. I have to blow up my own life to give further benefit to the people who harmed me? In this case, meaning... Um, like I'm going to blow up my own life to teach a lesson, which let's be clear, teaching a lesson is a favor you're doing for somebody. It's, it's of benefit to them. So like, I'm going to blow up my own life to teach a lesson to the people that already have like behaved selfishly in this moment. And I remember that blew my mind. I was very, I was much younger at the time. And this idea of just uh, the idea that like seeking punishment for the wicked was like centering the wicked and their needs over what the person who actually needed restitution was saying would be of the most benefit to them and realizing that in my like fervor to be a good ally to this person i was like completely passing over the very tangible things they were saying they needed to make their life better. That was a profound moment of asking me to reconsider what I thought justice was, right? Of like, is justice punishment for the wicked or is justice um, healing and restitution for the people that have been harmed? Not that it, not that it always is that dichotomy that clearly, and not that you can't, you know, um, and in some situations there's both, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying that this is an epiphany that like, I'm certainly right about this now, but it was a very eye opening moment for me on a personal level where I realized how much of my sense of right and wrong was based in centering the, the bad, the wicked, over what actual healing looks like for people that have been uh, the victims of harm. <laughs> wow. That is... I have never, ever considered that. Holy fuck. Yeah, I'm still wrestling with it as a concept because, look, I'm not going to sit here and say that, like... I am not an enlightened 
person by any means. When I see people do bad things in the world, I have the exact reaction you would expect because I want bad things to happen to them. And, you know, I, which is, which is a form of justice that, you know, it, it's not, and it's also, again, it's, it's, it's very different if that's what the people who have been harmed are asking for. And I think that there it's, it's still, it's even post that epiphany that in, in my life, it's like, it's not clean. It's, it's still a mess. Justice is still a, a rough idea to try to get your head around. But the idea of making your sense of justice, at least as a person, all about what it is that the harmed need because we don't have that, not in our legal system, not in our criminal justice system. There's no, you know, I mean, with with some exception, I guess you can like sue people to, to like collect damages, right? But like it, on a personal level, it's this idea of like, we will dissuade harmers from harming by threatening to harm them back harder or at least as hard as they harm, which is again, very centered on this idea of, of the wicked and I think too that there's this, I don't know, there's this little philosophical thought experiment of like, if you had two magical buttons, right? And your first button meant that every bad person, however you want to define that, would definitely have a bad life and come to a bad end. Like the, like the wicked would always get their just reward, right? Um, and as for decent and good people, and again, these categories are like, what the fuck are these categories? How do you define them? But for a thought experiment, let's go with it. And good people, it would just be chaos. Like some some good people would have meet horrible ends. Others would be okay. But you could make sure that every wicked person got theirs. And you had another magical button that meant every single person, regardless of their moral character, got to live with comfort, safety, dignity, flourishing, health, and happiness, which of the two buttons would you press? And that's a thought experiment that everyone is welcome to just, you know, marinate on. There, I, I, there's, there's no proctor. It's not a test, right? But it's wild to think about how much some people would rankle at that second button, the one, the one that would give everybody in the world health, happiness, dignity, safety, comfort, all of that because it would go to people that in our heads we've said are like undeserving. And there are some people that are really, you know, like there are people out there who, who you, you struggle with, with being like, could I accept that person with these qualities that I find monstrous having that life? But if you, I don't know, it's like, it's an interesting thought experiment. Could, like, like, would you push the button that just gave it means it means good and bad people both. Everybody gets comfort, dignity, happiness, safety. I would. I think I would too. Because yeah. I think there would be less harm if everyone had enough. I'm thinking about my own personal experiences of of being harmed, and how destructive the perspective is that I have on certain things. Where it's like, well, I want bad things to happen to you. You did a bad thing to me, and I want bad things to happen to you. Instead of going, am I okay? What do I actually need? Is moving on from this situation better for me? That is going, that's going to be one of the topics I stare at the ceiling about. That makes me so happy. If you could say your creativity had a theme, what would that theme be? I would say probably ethics. I would say probably like, like, like axiology, the study of value, of what value means the human project of our ability like our superpower is the ability to grant meaning to things our understanding of the concept of why and therefore our ability to assign purpose to things like you know things it's not that things just are but they are for something and I think every, pretty much everything I've ever done has in some way or another been about ethics and like, what do you do with your, going back to that Gandalf quote, you have this, this piece of time, you have to decide what to do with it. What do you do? And what is the right thing to do? And coming to those answers in the absence of a moral authority that can answer them for you 
means that everyone is experiencing the anxiety of having the first item on your to-do list be figure out what should be on this to-do list. What a harrowing group project we're all in together. <laughs> I propose a counterpoint to you. Imagine if someone told you exactly what your purpose was and you hated it. What if your purpose was you are a plumber, but I want to dance. You're a plumber and you have here are all the tools you need to plumb. Do it. Do you not think it's better to work inside uh, this arboraceous land of these trees of morality that we are unsure of instead of here is an open tilled plane here is your hoe get to work i i prefer the first than the second oh absolutely it it is so obviously the the yeah i mean like well not i guess not not for some people but at least for you and i it is extremely mm -hmm. obvious that these questions deserve to be answered by one's individual moral compass and that you have to arrive at these answers for yourself even if you are you know sort of like standing on the shoulders of giants you're you're like absorbing the epiphanies and wisdom of people that came before you even in that case you still much like any subject that you study you have to understand it yourself on an intuitive level to really have the knowledge. Even children quickly understand that because I said so is bullshit. Um, <laughs> it's so obviously unfair. The human spirit rankles in the face of, you know, it's a it's, it's this weird thing. But like, yeah, I, I don't think of myself as being purely rebellious rebellious that's not like my the place motivate i i firmly feel to use D, &D uh taxonomy neutral good i am not motivated by a particular like animus towards towards like or order and structure nor against chaos and disorder but there is like a authority is clearly to me like a a concept that is like every other it, it is not a tangible fixed point in other words like Outside of human feeling states, there is no authority out in the universe that exists aside from us pinning that sheriff's badge to it ourselves. You know, you can say something has authority and it has as much authority as you're willing to give it, but that's not, it's, that's not like plutonium. It's not a thing that's existing out there in the universe outside of your ability to think about it. It is a pure mental social construct. And as such, you, I think everyone, even if people don't admit it, they're always finding it for themselves. Even people are like, nope, it exists outside of me. There's an authority outside of me. It's sort of like, well, you, it's, you've, you've said that. And so it, in as much as you believe that it's true, but it is only as true as you believe it to be, just like it is for me and everybody else. So I think that, ooh, this was a tangent we got on. What question? What are we talking about? If you could say your creativity had a theme. Yes. So th I think that the, yeah, the exploration of ethics and the kind of like responsibility, which again, also a mental social construct responsibility, right? You know, my sort of belief of like, we're all in this group project where we have this incredible power to be aware of the universe and our place in it. We have the ability to assign meaning to things. We have the ability to ponder on the nature of purpose and every individual even individuals that have incredibly opposed or alien value sets to each other it seems like everybody assigns value they 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 prefer some things to other things some things are ethically more advantageous in whatever system that person has for themselves so that is to me the thing i like want to explore in everything that i do what makes you smile izzy my partner, I, that's the first thing that jumped to my head, but she, every time I see her, she makes me smile. That is the first and most primary thing that leapt unbidden to the front of my mind when you asked that question. She's in the other room right now, running a Zoom, like quarantine creativity summer camp for kids with an organization called Story Pirates. And she's so wonderful and fun, and she's making these kids lives. She's just there celebrating the words and ideas of kids impossible to think about her without smiling. Tell me about something you learned recently that amused you. Amused may not be the right word, 
but it certainly piqued my interest in a way that that made me go like ah so I'll 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 go in a broader definition of the word amused here. So as I said, I've been watching this lecture series on behavioral biology. And the lecturer, this guy Robert Sapolsky, was talking about all these ways that our fundamental behaviors are shaped by systems that you might not even consider. Uh, when you're thinking about it, you're like, you're like, how does this fact domino and produce this other thing? And one of those things that made me go like, ah, like shake my head was, and this is not what he said. This is my takeaway from it. The thing that results, so, okay, so first of all, ugh, getting ahead of myself, chimpanzees, our closest genetic relative, also practice warfare not interpersonal violence, group warfare for purposes outside of pure survival, which is really upsetting. One of the factors in why chimpanzees go to war is unlike other primates like baboons, chimpanzees, whenever you have tr family troops of primates or, or any kind of social animal like lions, um, you have to have, have either female or male exogamy, meaning either the uh, uh, either uh, females of the, of the species have to leave at puberty, or males of the species have to leave at puberty, lest you risk inbreeding. Right? Like uh, you, they have to go and seed into other troops, other prides, other whatever to, to have gene pools have variability. Right? So in baboons, they have male sex exogamy. So when the males of a troop get to puberty, the older males you know, beat them on the head, drive them away, those males go and join other troops. What that means is the culture of a baboon troop is sort of contained within the women, within the females of that troop, because they are all sisters, aunts, nieces, mothers and daughters to each other. And all these dudes are fucking strangers. They've like shown up to breed. Now what that means is all that heightened male aggression is these baboons are kind of nasty to each other. The dudes that are there are not blood relatives. Um, they might have little infant sons, but the other males of their age are also these exogamous individuals that showed up there to create breeding pairs. So they'll yell at each other and bite each other and hit each other, and all that male aggression is interpersonal. Now, when you go to chimpanzees, they have female exogamy. So the unrelated adults are females. And it's all the males who are uncles and nephews and brothers and fathers and sons to each other. As a result of that, there is an incredible level of male bonding and cooperation in chimpanzees, which means that all of their aggressive instincts or whatever are filtered through this uh, these strong blood ties between males that don't exist between the adult females in the group and as a result of that they have more intense male cooperation than baboons have and as a result of that they engage in warfare the baboons are so busy beating the shit out of each other so the, there's a way to recontextualize warfare, not as an artifact of male aggression, but warfare as an artifact of male cooperation and kinship. That war is a project you undergo because you get along with the other men in your group and go, um, let's go destroy the men of this other group. And if that's not a mind fuck, so again, amused is not the right word. It's not an amusing fact at all. But it is a bizarre, the way Sapolsky put it in the lecture is he was literally like, uh, he was like, nothing more dangerous than to know that a group of men near you are all getting along. <laughs> and it's an extremely ominous thing to say, but that is sort of what the research indicates is that, you know, a group of baboons, men are just punching each other and biting each other. N not a huge threat. This group of chimpanzees over here where they're all fathers and sons and uncles and nephews and brothers, 
goes like, okay, we found another troop of chimpanzees. We're going to go and slaughter them because we all get along. For a moment, I was amused from the feminine perspective that, haha, look at all these unenlightened, you know, that you, you get along, you have a golf club, and now you kill each other. Uh, <laughs> now I'm just terrified. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry it's such a terrifying fact, but it, well, it, it's it, war is such an a, a, atrocity abomination. And when you're thinking about it, it's it was very interesting to look at this example in primate behavior of of you need more than just aggression for war you need bonding for war you need this idea of like hey all of us have these powerful aggressive impulses but are not we all a band of brothers we aren't we all we're all in this together i mean which takes on you know an even different meaning for band of brothers in in a group of chimpanzees where literally the, the only adults that are siblings are brothers right because the the ingredients you need for war are yes aggression and hostility but also intense in group out group and you need it amongst males it's a it's this male project of because baboon females aren't exterminating each other but you get this group of chimpanzee males going like i i love you guys we're so closely bonded i get you look at look at the, the shared sense of unity we have let's wipe out the chimpanzees in this other part of the forest that would be a fun outing for us a good saturday afternoon activity let's just get <laughs> tattoos of each other let's have a couple of beers and let's just well, honestly commit genocide and war crimes against another group of bamboo it's like that, that's <laughs> chimpanzees that's that's just kind of how we operate you know that's all good it's uh, high exactly. five. yeah uh, <laughs> Um, scared. Scared. A really upsetting, but a deep insight. A deep insight, yeah. What is beautiful? I just thought of Izzy again. I know. It's, it's, I can't, I can't give the same answer twice. Ah, uh, Izzy is very, very beautiful. Um, and I can hear her in the other room doing her, her Story Pirates, uh, workshop right now. Tangential thought is very interesting because I love axiology. And it's funny because the sort of big twin disciplines of axiology are aesthetics and ethics. And I'm so much, it's, it's always so interesting that those, are, that those branches kind of exist within axiology where it's like the study of what is right and wrong and the study of like what is beautiful and what does like beauty mean philosophically. I would like to turn this over to you as well because I think it's so interesting to, uh, at least for me, I feel like you grow up in a culture where beauty, at least for me, there's like this connotation when you hear beauty, where at least my mind goes towards like beauty and then thinks of like vanity and be beauty as like, I think there's a lot in Western culture that wants to treat beauty as something frivolous even though it's something that a capitalist system constantly commodifies and makes absolutely necessary. So it's this weird love-hate relationship with the concept of beauty as like a thing that is so frivolous and is also the highest good and you should have it. You should have it and you should hate it. And the more I think about it, especially as someone who works in like art and media, there is absolutely, like, we, we were talking before about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And what I love about Maslow's hierarchy of needs is there's an understanding that, like, survival and food are a foundation of this pyramid, but they are all still needs. And the need for beautiful things and for beauty to be a part of your life feels really significant. Like, I don't know, it's if it, you, feel, you feel so dramatic saying it, but, like, Man, life without movies or art or the natural, the beauty of the natural world, like, what would life even be if I couldn't, like, see my family Christmas tree at home with all the little lights and ornaments on it? Not hardly worth it to the same degree, right? So it's so funny that, I don't know, that it's, it's, a, it's a, like a very complex thing. So in terms of what is beautiful to me, I think it's one of those rare philosophical concepts that actually is self-defining because i think like beauty is the thing which conjures in an individual a feeling of beauty right like in the same way that like with with colors you're like what's red and you're like well okay this is red see this whenever you see this this is red 
And I think with beauty, it's the same thing where it's like, oh, it, it is self-justifying or self, self-defining. Do you want my answer for what is beautiful? I do. Everything. Wow. Every single thing. So let's just kind of philosophically state this uh, uh, as such. So there exists a set of beautiful things. And this property we will call beauty. Uh, call, uh, the origin of this property means nothing, right? It, like, it doesn't matter if God gave it to you. It doesn't matter if you have a personal perspective on beauty. We all kind of agree there is a thing called beauty, right? Everything is beautiful because even in the deepest of tragedies, you will find a single beautiful moment. And a single droplet of beauty in, a, in an ocean of misery still is beautiful. And it transforms the ocean. If you see, if there is a shipwreck and a survivor is grasping on to this brick, and in his, la- in, in his last moments before he subsumes himself underneath the ocean, never to be seen again, he dreams of his homeland. And he dreams of his wife that he will never see. And he puts a smile on his face and he disappears. That is beautiful. And in that entire ocean, then, for all eternity, is locked a moment that no one will ever see again and ever experience but this one man. But we can dream it. We can think it. And everything, there exists a beauty. There exists a recognition that even in the truly evil, the moment where they realize that they did wrong, even if they don't intend to change anything, the fact that they know that they did wrong, or... In a moment where you get your heart broken, there exists this moment of, I wanted and cherished this person more than I could ever express, but now that is nothing. And in that nothingness, in the release of emotion then, in the visceral neglecting of these emotions, that's beauty. Or... I don't know how else to describe it, but the actual normative fist of realization that comes in everything. And there are things that are directly, aesthetically beautiful, rolling hills, a summer's day. But there is also beauty in tragedy and in comedy and in crystallized moments. They are beautiful. Everything, no matter what, no matter how shit my day is, how, no matter how awful the world can be there you will always find something beautiful well there's a consistency because what you just said is beautiful so so far the theory is being borne out that is really beautiful it's really mm-hmm. interesting and i think what i really something i really jive with what you're saying is is the, joy is real pain is real fear is real um, you know, anger is real. These emotions are real and they are valid. But I think I think what's kind of interesting that, that goes with what you're saying is I do, part of me believes, even if this is a little bit naive, part of me believes that there is something purer about joy and love and connection because for some reason, I just feel like other experience, it, it, to back up what you're saying about like, is it, like everything being beautiful. I think a lot about other emotions. And I was talking with someone online recently who was trying to process grief. And one of the things I was saying, because they were just, they were very disheartened by world events and they were feeling kind of hopeless. And I remember saying to them, I was like, you know, the the reason these none of this would hurt if we didn't have something worth losing you wouldn't be afraid if you weren't afraid of losing something you treasure like all of these feelings arrive at and seem to reference something primary and the primary thing they seem to be referencing is a joy at life when I bite into a cheeseburger deluxe medium well with grilled onions, waffle fries, chocolate milkshake, there is no r- reference that the joy I feel is making. It is primary. I am eating this cheeseburger 
and I love this cheeseburger. It is a direct relationship. It references nothing else. There is no footnote here. There is no C page 37 for an analysis of terms. It is primary. When I feel afraid that the diner may be closed, and I may not get my cheeseburger, that is referential and therefore secondary because I understand the joy I will feel at that cheeseburger and the fear of not getting it only exists in reference to the cheeseburger. When I feel rage that my friend has taken my cheeseburger and hidden it somewhere in the diner, that is referential to the cheeseburger. When I feel grief and sadness that I have finished my cheeseburger and thus may no longer eat my cheeseburger, that is referential to the primary joy of eating the cheeseburger. So in your point about everything being beautiful, I think I do agree with that because I think that, I don't know, maybe, maybe this is a very like theoretical victory, but it does feel like there is some strength or power in beauty because it is primary and self-justifying and self-reinforcing. And everything that a person might individually classify as being not beautiful still has to exist in reference to beauty because that's the concept that comes first and is self-reinforcing. I would 100% agree with that. And this kind of referential pyramid or like the pure stream and the references that all kind of collate into this holistic view of beautiful is, is a, a, a building upon or a sequel to my understanding, which uh, has kind of enriched it and if I if I may give it just a, a brief point on grief, grief is a very Western idea. The pain of losing someone isn't a Western idea, but the suffering of losing someone is a Western idea. Because we do not love something because it ends, right? We we don't in no experience that you've ever had extreme pain or that you've been, you know, hospitalized or that you had a really unpleasant day, you're not like, oh God, I love that day because it ended. In the same way that with, to use your analogy of the cheeseburger, you don't love the cheeseburger because it is over. The cheeseburger, you love the cheeseburger and you experienced it in its totality. So if you love someone and they pass away, they are none the lesser and your emotions are none the lesser for the fact that they have ended. And... Mm -hmm. You may say to yourself, oh, but I will never experience them again. Yes, but how many things in life do you get to experience the completeness of outside of a box set or a book or a TV show? If you get to have a person, you get to experience a person in their totality, in whatever role in your life, that, that is beautiful. Because even though you will never get anything new from them, you actually will because they, sh they have shaped you mm -hmm. and your love for them doesn't, it doesn't matter if it's over because it isn't. You just experienced the box set. You want, you binge watched it. And that's good. You know, <laughs> uh, I, I think that, um, that, that for me is where, um, I find a lot of my solace when, when I see particular things that evoke deep feelings of grief or sorrow is um, I had it and my feelings for it never, never diminish because it is over. Uh, they just morph and they change and they become something else. I love that. This is, I really like the fact that this question comes next. Would you describe yourself as cute and cuddly? No, I don't think I would describe myself as cute and cuddly. I'm sure if we think of cute and cuddly as sort of like concepts on a spectrum, like there's a slider of cute and cuddly, there are certainly things that are less cute and cuddly than me. But I don't know if the mass of things <laughs> on <laughs> one side of the slider is greater than that on the other side of the slider. So to, to set that as a like label on myself, I don't know that I I don't know that I feel I have earned those titles. If if I put the work in to get cuter and cuddlier, if I used fabric softener on my body and I don't know, there there are some biohacking things I could do to make myself I think objectively cuter and cuddlier, but until I put the work in, I don't feel that I 
have a claim to those titles. Where do you feel safest? I, huh, that's interesting. Where do I feel safest? I think that the 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 where part of the question is interesting. So there's like a there's like a more like philosophical answer to this question, and there's like a more literal one. In the literal sense, I think that the biggest factor to my physical animal feeling of safety is rarely location based and is almost always person based. I feel safest around the people I love and trust. And I think that maybe it's all the D&D playing, but I think in the midst of a very scary haunted house, if I was there with my closest friends, I would feel safer than I would in my own home by myself. Which maybe I should explore that. <laughs> maybe that sounds like, huh. Um, but yeah, my sense of safety, I don't think comes from location as much as it comes from company. But on a more metaphysical level, I don't know, my, my mind flashed to that quote of, I think it was like, it's a Helen Keller quote, right? Where she says like, hopefully this is a real, this is a real quote and not something that's like misattributed. If it's misattributed, I will live in shame forever. But I believe Helen Keller said this. Uh, Security is mostly a superstition. It does not exist in nature, nor do the children of men as a whole experience it. Avoiding danger is no safer in the long run than outright exposure. Life is either a daring adventure or nothing. And there's part of that I agree because when you're when you know all measures of security are temporary right we know at the end of this life what is coming for us all measures of security are fundamentally about buying more time not to diminish like so, you know safety and security is very real and i wish the world were safer and more secure for everybody but on that broader philosophical level i do think that there are some behaviors rooted around fear and insecurity that do seem to negatively impact people's lives. It seems that that like keeping oneself safe can become a, for, for some people it is absolutely vital and essential, but for other people it seems like, especially people that have a lot of safety and security already, the pursuit for more of that can become a healthy, an unhealthy fixation especially when the things you're trying to keep yourself safe from become more and more intangible and impossible to safeguard against. Like people that, you know, are trying to have safety against, I don't know, like risk of any kind, even risk that would just result in like embarrassment or risk that would result in discomfort. And it's sort of like, oh, you know, you are trying to escape from something that is inescapable. Like these, these things that you are trying to avoid are unavoidable and the strategy you are employing therefore will often disappoint you. You will often be heartbroken by your attempts to evade that which is impossible to evade. If you were on a starship, what position would you hold? Ooh, what position would I hold on a starship? Oh, that would be very, ooh. Oh my goodness. Science officer. I want to be a science officer. There are, so there's so many fun positions on a starship. It's like pilot, fun, captain is fun. But for me, first of all, what I like about being a science officer on a starship is it implies that the starship I'm on is one that needs a science officer. So it's sort of a backdoor way for me to control the mission of the starship that I'm on to make sure that we are on a mission of discovery and exploration. That would be very, I would like that too. Uh, My favorite space stories are the ones where, you know, where we are going to try to better understand our universe. So science officer, for sure. Do you think there is more good than bad in the world? Yes. Yes, I do. I do think there is more good than bad in the world. It's a very interesting question, right? Because are good and bad quantifiable you know i'm of the belief that if there were no if there were no sapient life forms of any kind in the universe i'd think that there would be no good or evil like if the universe had no organs by which to create meaning i do not think that even if there were stars and nebula and comets and everything like that that there would be good or evil because there there would be no ability to assign value there is i do kind of believe that life forms are to our knowledge 
the organ that the universe has to ascribe meaning to things, which is, by the way, you know, to, to kind of jump to, for anyone, I don't know if anyone who's listening to this will have listened to Fantasy High or listened to Dimension 20, but that thing that the Void says to Kristen, spoilers, uh, at the end of Fantasy High of you mortal beings are the instrument by which the universe cares. That's kind of, when we go, when we go back to talking about authority, that's kind of what I believe. Because I think people, when people look for what is the meaning of life, what is purpose, and they ignore their ability to assign meaning, that always strikes me as bizarre because it's sort of, I don't know, it would be like a hand asking, well, who's here to grab things? It's like, dog, you, you're the, it's you, you're the, you are the, the one. So when a human being says, what's the meaning of life? It's like, do you not see that you were perfectly, uh, I don't want to say engineered because there wasn't an engineer, but do you not see that you're way more qualified to answer this question than the rocks and space debris surrounding you. Isn't this kind of your call? And who would have more authority than you? And why are you so, you know, it's sort of like, I, I understand that human beings arrive and media res. We're born into a world where things have been going on. And so we don't feel emboldened it's sort of like you walk into this ancient world that has all this history and you see the controls of this giant civilization. You see that the, you know, there are all these steering wheels available for all of us to kind of contribute and move our civilizations forward. And so many people look at those controls, even the little tiny ones in their own life, and are like, um, what am I supposed to do with it? And it's like, well, grab them. Of course, they're there for you to, of course, what else would they be there for? Uh, but I do think a lot of people want that meaning to have a seal of approval. They want that meaning to be authoritative, even though it seems pretty clear to me that the only that it seems pretty clear to me that there is no sheriff in this town. There's just this little star in the dirt. And we should you should probably pick it up and put it on yourself because it's just laying there. So I strongly believe that authority is arbitrary and therefore it's up to every single person to kind of dub themselves worthy of assigning meaning. And therefore, when I think about is there more good than bad in the universe, I think that because it's our collective task to delineate what good and bad even means, and that doesn't mean that it's arbitrary in, in the way where it's random, but I think it means like, you know, you can make moral judgments, but you still have to input the values. In other words, I think it's fair for us all to say, hey, we're going to agree that human flourishing and health and well-being is a moral good. That decision to value that is arbitrary, but the moral decisions you make after that aren't necessarily arbitrary. So if someone's going around murdering people, you can be like, hey, with the given that human life is worthwhile and we all want people to be happy and flourish, with that given input, you doing this murder stuff absolutely is wrong. Point being, because people have the ability to give themselves that authority to delineate good from bad, for us to engage in this group project together where we are constantly honing our understanding of ethics and hopefully get always as individuals and as a species getting more ethical than we were yesterday, coming into a better understanding of how to increase the support for and amount of the, val the things that we are valuing for, the things that we are optimizing for. I believe that there is more good than bad because every day we are trying to increase the sum of good and lessen the share of bad. And even though I wouldn't be able to put a numerical value to those things, it feels like the fact that we are engaged in the project brings us back full circle to that idea of perfect. I don't know that we'll ever get to a West Pole, but we are certainly hopefully headed West.